What's up squad? Thank you so much for coming by and checking out another video here on the channel. And always thank you so much for the love and support on all of our prior uploads. If you haven't yet, make sure you go check out our latest video, our trip to the New England card show Spring Fling. Had so much fun there. Uh, make sure you go check it out. It's one of our most viewed videos here on the channel now. So again, thank you guys so much for the support. And if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn your notification bell on so you get alerted to all the new content drops here on the channel. All right guys, so in today's video, I figured let's bring it back. Let's rewind things. Let's put people in my shoes how I was a few months ago when I had taken a 20 year break from the hobby and was starting to get back into it. I feel like we need to refresh some people's terms, let them kind of know what's really going on. So we're gonna do a little sports card 101 here in this video. Uh, so you guys who are either getting back into the hobby or are new to the hobby can get refreshed with some terms and some verbiage that's used so you know what we're all talking about when we're talking about cards. So first, let's go over cards. You know, what you might see out there if you're at local card shows, if you're at your card store, you know, what you're gonna be looking at when you're out there. And I feel like the best way to explain that is, let's rip a pack. So I got a little Bowman 2023 here. It's not gonna guarantee I'll be able to have all my talking points here in this pack, but it's a little interesting caveat here to the video. If you guys haven't been, you know, we got some pack openings on the channel, go check them out. But as far as cards go, when you rip a pack, you're gonna have base cards. Those are kind of your veterans, your stars in the league, all that kind of stuff. And then you're gonna have your rookie cards, which are your more desirable base cards. So here, opening rip, we got a Nick Prado. And see that little RC right there? That means it's a rookie card. So you'll see that kind of commonly throughout cards that you buy if you see those. So here we got Miguel Cabrera. That's a base card. He's a veteran, been in the league many, many years. This is actually his last year here, so we'll kind of go through. Got a little Oscar Gonzalez. I'll try to read these reverse style on the cam. Vaughn Grisham, that also a rookie card. Logan O'Hoppe, rookie card. Then we got James Ottman as well. And now here, a nice hit for us here is Drew Jones, number one pick. So aside from base cards, you also have insert cards, which are different from the base. They are their own sets. If you look at a base card like this James Outman, it's got a number on the back for what card he is in the series, this being card 13. This insert card of Drew Jones is gonna have a different number. See MP03 or MP3 there. So it's its own set, great pull there. Modern Prospects is the set or the insert series. So that's why it says MP3. His is the third of those Modern Prospect cards. Then we'll kind of go through here as well. We got Daniel Susak, Jesus Baez, Jackson Holiday, great pull there. He was the number one pick last year in the draft. Then we got Kyle Harrison. Now these are Bowman Chrome first. So these are kind of an insert series in the Bowman where they're different from those base cards. So you got base here. These are the Bowman Chrome. It's got that Chrome refractor, but you also see that there are paper firsts. So Bowman does a little thing where they have rookie cards, but they also have first. So this is his first Bowman card. Not really a rookie card because he's still a prospect, not in the pros yet, but that's his Bowman first. Kyle Harrison, Christian Hernandez is last there. So that's kind of the quick breakdown of some of the cards you might see if you're buying a pack at you know Walmart, Target, your local card store. Just a quick breakdown of kind of base versus inserts. So now aside from your normal base and inserts, your base set rookie cards, those most desirable of the base you're looking for, there are cards called parallels, which are basically base cards, but they have a variation to them. So right here, we got this Paul Pierce prism, just a base card, it's normal silver right there, but then you also have the red, white, and blue parallel. Exact same card, but just, you know, we got the new border as the red, white, and blue versus, you know, the base, but this goes on and on. You got your 75th anniversary parallel. Prism is big at doing this whole set here, you know. Personally, I got a whole Paul Pierce rainbow going on. So that's just kind of parallel, guys. So you'll see those base sets, but in packs, you might see one that's a different color than those normal bases. That's a parallel card. Now, guys, when cards are produced, they are produced in what's called print runs. So this is the allotted amount they are going to make of certain cards. Now, base cards, inserts, they produce those cards in the thousands, tens of thousands. You know, those are the cards you're commonly going to be pulling. 
but then you'll have cards that are called numbered cards, which are a limited number. It can be a short print, which we'll go into, and super short print, but for now, let's kind of go over numbered kind of parallels as well and kind of what those print runs are. So like we go back to the Paul Pierce as the example, here's your base, no number or anything. You can pull this thousands of times, but this one right here is the red parallel, red prism actually. And if you look on the back, it's got a number right there. It's numbered to 299. So there's only 299 copies of this card. This is number 175 of 299. So there are only like I said, 299 of this copy of that card. Now, when print runs are made, they can come in like 299, 500, 999. Back in the day, I have a Barry Bonds card that's one of 10,000. So these print runs have varied, um, but now it's kind of limited to, they do the numbered ones, but then there's also cards that are short print and super short print. All right guys, so like I was saying, there's numbered cards as far as print runs for trading cards, but then there's also cards that are short print or super short print. So these are cards that aren't necessarily numbered, but there are still limited quantities available of them. So if we go back to my Paul Pierce's, you know, I have the base prism, but then if you look, there's also this one right here, which is the green, yellow, blue scope prism, but it's not numbered but it's still a rare card. You can only get it out of certain products, um, things like that. And then you have the super short prints, which are, you know, if you're in the hobby, these are the cards that you're constantly chasing, your kabooms, your downtowns. Uh, this right here is a super short print. It's a Patrick Mahomes crunch time. Uh, it's a case hit out of Donra. So case hits as well are those super short prints. So you wanna do your research on those because you might get a, a short print or a super short print that's not numbered, but it's still a super rare and valuable card. So make sure you kind of look a little bit and know what the short print and super short print runs are of the cards that you're gonna be looking for. Now guys, back to numbered cards real quick. Numbered cards are, you know, like I said, short print cards. They're very desirable, nice hits when you can get them, but there are certain numbered cards that are more desirable than others. So of course, uh, the first one I would mention are first off print. So these are the ones that are, you know, the first one printed, so 01. So like this Wes Welker I have right there, you can see it's one of 60. So that's kind of more desirable is getting that first on print. Uh, that's what it's called when you get that 01 out of 60 or out of 200, whatever it may be. Another highly sought after numbered card is gonna be a jersey match number. So whatever number that player wore in the pros, if you can get that number matched on a card, that makes it a little bit more desirable as well. So like this Vince Carter, one of my guys, artist proof out of hoops, it's numbered 15 out of 25. And of course, Vince Carter was number 15. So I really like that card being a jersey match numbered card as well. And then out of all the numbered cards, the most desirable of all are gonna be your one of ones. These are, of course, when it's a one of one, it's the only card that's created of that kind on earth. So that, I have an example as well. We got my Bobby Witt here out of Bowman Platinum. It's got the one of one right there in the light. So you can see one of one in different ways. It comes one slash one. I know some of the higher end series do a one of one with cursive. That looks really nice. So of course, those are your biggest chases. That's the only one of that card available. So it's gonna be your most valuable form of that card as well. So those are probably my three most desirable numbered cards you guys can look for if you ever pull a numbered card or are looking for a numbered card for your collection. All right guys, now that we've covered our bases on base cards, inserts, numbered cards, let's move on up and talk about autograph cards. Now back in the day when I was a young collector before I took my break, autograph cards you know, were highly desired, but all the cards were on card autographs, which means the player physically signed the card himself. Like here's an example for you guys. This Matt Moore out of Press Pass from 2007, he signed the physical card itself. You can't see anything else. Where nowadays, in the efforts of expediting players' times and things of that nature, they sign stickers and then those stickers are placed on the card. And these are referred to as sticker autos, which by Xander Bogarts here, you can see it's not on card. There's like a Panini sticker there that he signed that says Panini in the background as well. 
So make sure that's something you're looking out for when you're looking up autograph cards. The on-card autos are more desirable when it comes to autograph cards. And then you also have to deal with the possibility of forgeries with those sticker autos. Um, you know, each card does come certified from the company when you get it that says, hey, this guy signed this in front of our witness. But it's always, you never know with sticker autos. And that's kind of a bigger thing in today's hobby is having those sticker autos, just like I said, in the effort of expediting a player's time where he doesn't have to physically sign those cards. Though for more of the higher end cards, those 101s out of 10s, out of 25s, those really nice cards, those cards are typically on card autos. But like this Xander Bogarts out of uh, triple threads is number two out of nine. So I got the jersey match for Xander. But ended up being a sticker auto. So I was a little disappointed with that, but again, be weary of that guys. Obviously I wasn't weary of that when I got this cause I would have preferred an on card, but just keep that in mind when you're looking at those auto cards, is it on card or is it a sticker auto? And then also for autograph cards right now, there's a big boom for inscriptions guys. So if you see that moving forward, I know Victor Wembanyama just signed his first pro card and it's gonna be in Bowman University. And the first one that he signed, he actually wrote on it, you know, my first autographed card. So that card's obviously gonna be highly desirable. Jake LaRavia of the Memphis Grizzlies also is a big guy who inscripts his autographs. So I think that inscription side of the auto game might be a big thing moving forward. So if you have some of your favorite players out there that are doing some inscriptions on autos, be a lookout for those. Now, aside from autograph cards, the other big one are the memorabilia cards. And these have taken a huge leap since I was an early collector. Most of them were just jersey patches. Nowadays, you can get jerseys, you can get bats, balls, cleats, shoelaces. It's crazy the different memorabilia cards you can get. They're all awesome. They're all high, highly desirable. But there's definitely some things you need to know about these memorabilia cards. The main thing you need to know about the memorabilia cards is was it actually game worn? Was it event worn? Or is it not specific? Which means that it wasn't a game worn issue jersey, anything like that. So let's go over a couple examples here. So first, again, got to go with the old cards because they just were all game worn. So this here is a Marvin Harrison out of 2006 Donruss playoff. And on the back here, you can see Donruss wrote that it was cut from an authentic jersey personally worn by Marvin Harrison in an NFL game. So that means this game, this card, this piece of patch is officially game used. So you always want to look for those indicators on the card that says that this was game used is the key word um, for those patches. Now, aside from game used, you might also have a player worn event worn, which means that this patch wasn't used in a game, but the player did in fact wear it at some point, whether it was in a hotel, at practice, at an event. So like this card here I have also out of 2007 Don Russ is a Robert Meacham dress for success with some helmet clips, but these clips weren't worn in a game. They're actually worn at a rookie premiere event. So still a cool piece. He did wear it, but it wasn't worn in a game. So it's not game used. It is player worn though. And then lastly is the newest kind of thing, which is that it's not specific. So it doesn't say whether it was game used, player worn. Uh, they just, they're just not gonna tell you. So I got this Ramondre from <clears throat> Panini itself. And you can see on the back, it always says underneath here, the enclosed authentic memorabilia is not from any specific game or event. So that's kind of how things have moved forward uh, with a lot of mems, uh, these patches, I'll, a lot of them say that. So when you're looking in the patch game and you're hunting for those nice patches you want for your collection, it is more desirable to go after those game used player worn items because they actually had that direct contact with the player that or was used in a game versus the not specific which you know you don't know what exactly it is that you got here for this patch also with patches guys a lot of people like to look for multiple colors in the patch so where i showed you that room or this ramondre stevenson it's got the single navy color patch so it's a one color patch there are dual color patches tri-color patches quad color patches like this tristan tristan cassis i have right here is a tri-color it's got the white the navy and the red from his red Sox jersey so those ones that do have multiple colors in them are definitely more desirable and are great pieces to have for your collection so Whatever it is or whoever you are collecting and you want to collect those memorabilia items, definitely look for those game used ones and those multiple color patches for sure. And then lastly, guys, with patches and autograph cards, 
out of this whole category, the most desirable ones are gonna be your rookie patch autos, which are called RPAs. So these ones are rookie cards, as well as patches, as well as autographs. So we'll bring out old Ramondre again. As you can see, it's got the rookie card symbol, meaning it's a rookie card, has the patch right there. So there's your R, there's your P, bingo, there's your A with the autograph. So when you see that phrase RPA, it means rookie patch autographed, given that that card is a rookie card, has a patch, and has an autograph. All right, guys, so we've covered the different kinds of cards. Now let's talk about how to buy them and what you're buying exactly. So now there are two different forms of cards you can buy in essence. They're all the same. It's just depending on where you're buying them from. So it's going to come down to retail versus hobby. Now, retail cards, guys, these are the packs or boxes that you'll find like these. These are typically the blaster box. You can find these at Walmart, Target, different, you know, retail stores, grocery stores might carry them sometimes. Even your card store might carry these, but they're typically retail exclusives. As you can see, you know, it says retail on the box right there. And, you know, I'll get into the difference between retail and hobby a little bit, but, you know, Retail itself has some exclusive to it, but when you're buying retail, it's gonna be a little bit cheaper than buying hobby, which is the benefit and why it's you know more cost efficient and you find it more in more common places like Target and Walmart versus your hobby product, which is gonna be a little bit more expensive. But when you're comparing what you're gonna be getting out of the product, retail is gonna have fewer hits in the boxes, which are those higher end cards, those numbered cards, autograph cards. They're not gonna be hit as much in that retail versus hobby where you're gonna be getting what you pay for. So typically hobby boxes will guarantee at least one, two autos in a box, an auto and a patch, something along those lines to make sure that when you're paying that higher price point, you're gonna be getting something of value in that box. Like I was saying, the hobby boxes do carry those bigger hits with it being a bigger product, more expensive, and typically only going to be found at your local card stores or on online platforms like Fanatics or Panini, you know, buying directly from those wholesalers uh, to get that hobby product. Otherwise, retail is still a great option. And like I said, retail does have its own exclusive. So, you know, if you're building something for Bowman here, or you want a specific card, this box is the only way you can get the green parallel. So we talked about parallels before. The green version, say you're a Mariners fan and you want a Julio Rodriguez that has the green border, you're only gonna get it out of these boxes. So there are benefits to buying a retail. Again, you wanna look at the box, see what's specifically in the box, and you know, make sure it's gonna be bang for your buck and then in the end i always say it's good to go for the hobby the hobby product save your money up you're going to get better hits you're going to get better bang for your buck but i also did hit my 101 bobby wit out of retail products so i'll never dog retail but you know if between the two i'll always go hobby but in the end it's whatever is better for you financially and whatever you enjoy more between the two products if you can buy more retail and you're ripping more do that if you enjoy it do it all right, guys, so aside from either buying product from retail stores or your local card store and buying that hobby product, the big thing that has taken off in the recent years is participating in breaks. Now, breaks come in all shape and form. Typically, they're held online, um, you know, maybe Facebook, Instagram, whatnot does a lot of breaks as well. Uh, and this is where you're all in a room. Typically, they come as either group breaks or personal breaks. When you're in a group break, Let's put football, for example, they'll have, you know, a bunch of boxes for football. It will have a certain price point, you know, say there's five boxes there. You pay $200 to participate in the break. And then there'll be eight people that'll participate. They'll break the NFL into conferences. So they'll do AFC East, NFC East, you know, AFC North, NFC North, South, West, all that. So you'll have eight different divisions. Each person will pay their amount and then they'll open all the boxes. And then whatever cards hit for your division, you take those cards home. So that's what a group break is if you see them around. So it's typically, you can either buy divisions. If it's baseball, typically you can do it by the team. So certain teams will have certain price points depending on the inserts and the autographs, the patches that are gonna be available for those certain teams. The ones that have the more desirable patches, desirable autographs, desirable players will of course be more uh, will be higher price points in those breaks. But it's a good way for you to kind of get in on a break and maybe hit a big card, you know, for a few hundred dollars that might be worth a few thousand. 
And then aside from group breaks, you can also do personal breaks sometimes with these channels where they'll have all that product available, which you might not be able to find online or at your retailer locally or at your local card store. And you can buy the product from them and they'll rip it on camera for you. Uh, so typically, most people participate in group breaks, but those higher end, those ballers out there uh, can rip some huge personal breaks. I've seen some guys drop almost 10 grand just ripping product themselves. It's, it can be crazy. And then finally, guys, I say the last place for you to go when you're looking for cards to add to your collection is definitely online, either different marketplaces. eBay, of course, is the big one where, you know, I do a lot of my singles, either buying or selling is on eBay. Uh, you can find the specific card you're looking for. If you're not wanting to be that person to buy packs and hunt certain cards, take that gamble. Instead, you want to just put your money into specific cards. I definitely recommend that as the form to do it. You can, you know, find good deals, interact with good uh, marketplace, those sellers on there, the vendors. They're good people, always looking to make a deal. If you find a few cards you want, you can always match them up for a better deal. Try to get some shipping knocked down as well. Uh, so I'll always advocate for that. Facebook has also been a platform that's taken off for card sales you know, since COVID. I would be wary of a little bit of Facebook action. You never know who you're going to meet out there. But you know, if you can interact, find a good person you know on there. I've done a few deals on Facebook that have gone perfectly okay. Uh, so definitely online, if you're looking for those specific cards, or getting groups or lots of cards in one bang, that might be your best form for acquiring those cards. Now, guys, when you are buying cards, you might notice something with shipping you might see some acronyms you're not familiar so we'll go with the two most common ones you might see some people ship pwe and some people ship bmwt now pwe just means it's a plain white envelope so this means there's no extra bang there they'll probably put your card in a team bag put some cardboard around it tape it up throw it in an envelope and send it your way uh, no additional cost on that. It's typically the cheapest form of shipping your cards around. Um, it's, like I said, the most common and cheapest form that you'll see around. But then if other people want to step it up a little bit, you got your more higher end cards, those cards you want to keep safe for transit, you're going to go with the bubble mailer with tracking, which is what the acronym BW, BMWT stands for. Uh, so this, of course, is going to be a bubble mailer, extra security for your package. And like I said, it comes with that tracking so you can see exactly where your package is as it goes. I know with eBay specifically, they give you tracking on either form which you buy, whether it's PWE or the bubble mailer. But that is the benefit. The bubble mailer will be a little bit more expensive, but it gives you that extra protection to your card, as well as the ability to track your card and see where it's at um, in its transit to you. Let's move on to now, how are you protecting your cards that you get? You get these cards online, maybe they don't come in top holders, maybe you're buying a handful of cards out of a dollar bin at a card show. How are you protecting your cards? So first off, all your cards need to be in a penny sleeve. They call them penny sleeves because they're wicked cheap. You get a hundred of them for, I think, $2, a dollar or two. They should be a dollar if they're penny sleeves, right? So you want those, you want all your cards in penny sleeves for sure, whether you're putting them in boxes. It's just that initial, the basic layer of protection for your cards to keep them safe from damage. And then moving on from that, once you get your card in that penny sleeve, you want to put it in the top loader, just like I did with the Drew Jones we pulled earlier, got it penny sleeved up and top loaded there. So that's the most common form of protection for your cards is to have it penny sleeved and top loaded. If you want to take an extra step beyond then with those more higher end cards, you can also get one touches. So these are magnetic cases that you put your cards in. You lay your card down there. Typically, I put, the, I put a penny sleeve on top of it as well, just for that extra protection on the surface. And then you put it closed, magnet sealed, just extra thicker protection, of course, compared to, you know, the basic top loader if you want to go that extra step for protecting your card. Now, guys, if you are buying one touches and top loaders for your cards, a key thing to know is the card size. So cards will vary in size. You know, you have your basic, you know, that card thickness all the way up to, you know, this Tristan Cassis card I showed you. Look how thick that bad boy is. I think this is a 180 point top loader so you want to know the thickness of your cards it does it's not going to say on the package anywhere like that the best place to look is i actually found out bcw on their top loader cases actually has a chart you can probably download them online as well but at least with this chart you can then take your card you know and you basically just match it up with the thickness 
and see what it works. So this one, of course, is your basic card. But then say you had the Tristan Cassis card, you know, you got to go all the way up to your, you know, 180, 190, that range. So if you guys didn't know that, look for these BCW top loaders. Keep one handy because it does have the gauge here. So you know what size either top loaders or one touch mag cases you need to be buying to keep your card safe. And lastly, guys, the final form of possibly protecting your card is, of course, to get your card graded. Grading cards has taken off since I left the hobby and made my triumphant return. I remember in the 90s, early 2000s, you'd see graded cards here and there. People occasionally sent them off, but it was not as big of a thing as it is now. Anytime you go to a show, you see graded cards everywhere. But there is a method to the madness, guys. There is a reason you should be getting your cards graded. A, like I said, it protects your card, but it also authenticates your card that it is what it is. In a day and age now where people can replicate all kinds of things and make reproductions, getting your card graded and letting it people know, hey, this is officially that card is you know, what it's all about. And then lastly, it just tells you what the quality of your card is, you know, what the condition is and, you know, how valuable, how valuable your card can be. Now, cards are graded on a 1 to 10 scale. 1, of course, being the worst, 10 being the best. And then, of course, all the different companies have different names for 10s. PSA calls 10s a gem mint 10. You know, you have, I think, BCG does the black label pristine, which is highly sought after if you're getting your card graded. So these companies have different things, but of course it's graded on a scale of one to 10, one being the worst, 10 being the best. Now, when the company receives your card and grades it on that 10 point scale, they're gonna be grading it across four different categories. That's gonna be the centering of the card, the edges, the corners, and the surface. All these areas are gonna be graded on a 10 point scale, and then cumulatively, they'll average that out to what the value of your card will be. So that way, if you have a gem mint 10, you got most likely 10s across the board in those four categories. Now guys, when it comes to grading and where to send it, there are, I'd say, four major companies that handle card grading. And of course, the top dog, the most known about one, is gonna be PSA. Here's a PSA gem mint 10 Randy Moss rookie card. So this is an example of what the PSA slabs or graded cards look like. Then you're gonna also have Beckett or BGS, Beckett Grading Service. So here they have that clear. And I was saying up here, if you get the black pristine 10, this silver label will be a black label, but here's kind of how a Beckett slab looks. Now there's also SGC, who's known as the tuxedo of the grading industry because they go with the black background there. It's a very clean look. Uh, you know, very common for a lot of the older cards. It looks really nice with a lot of the vintage tobacco era cards. Looks really good. And then I'd say lastly is going to be CSG right here. Here's an example of what a CSG graded card looks like as well. Uh, but those are your top four. You know, everyone has their own reasons on why they like the companies. Some of the companies offer different specials, but as far as resale and selling value, PSA, I think, is going to hold the most value in the game right now. But the other companies are definitely on their heels. I know SGC is gaining a lot of ground as well. Uh, but the thing also to know, guys, is the pricing is going to vary across these companies. So some are cheaper than other, uh, and some will do specials. Like SGC right now, uh, for that Bowman product we pull, I think for the month of May and possibly even further, they're running a special $9 a card for Bowman 2023. So I can send this Drew Jones to SGC tomorrow if I wanted and only be $9 versus it's typically anywhere from $15 to $20 to get a card graded. So it's a great discount there and you'll see kind of the companies roll those specials out in order to try to get a little bit more business going. And it's a great tactic that SGC is doing. I'm definitely going to be sending them some cards myself. Um, but that's kind of a little bit on the top four companies you see grading cards mostly in the hobby. So aside from the top four companies we spoke of, there are definitely smaller companies that are doing their own to try to separate themselves from those bigger companies and create their own little niche. A lot of it is um, customization of labels has grown a lot. I know Flow Labels, one company that I've uh, met with before at prior shows, if you go check out the New England Card Show vlog, our first one, I met with the guys at TGA and they do really cool Flow Labels. I'll put one 
right here on the video, especially for Pokemon cards where they carry the art up through into the label that shows the grading. Uh, it's a really cool piece. So especially cards that you're going to keep for your own collection and not looking to resell, maybe looking at some of this customization that they are doing for slabs at these smaller companies. And also, like I said, those price points are going to be a little bit lower than you have with those big four companies as well. And then guys, lastly, when it comes to getting your card graded, a benefit of getting your card graded too is it provides a little bit of rarity to it. So this Gem Mint 10 Randy Moss, if I go and scan the back here, this little QR code, I'll put the info here on the video as well. You can see it pops up and it will show how many of these cards exist and what it will say is the population. So it's called a population report when you're looking these up and it tells you how many of these exact 1998 Bowman's Best Randy Moss Gem Mint 10s exist with PSA. And of course, the lower the pop report, the rarer the card is. So you wanna have, you know, pop reports in the single or double digits uh, are best, you know, cause it shows that little bit more rarity to that card. Like this Andrew Jones I have through Beckett, it's only a nine, you know, which is like, oh, I wish it was a 10, but this is only, uh, it's a pop one. So it's the only one of this card that's been graded a nine. So it's technically a one of one as well. There's no other card in the world right now that's this card that's rated a nine through Beckett. But there's also no cards rated higher with it with Beckett. So there's no 9.5 or 10. So it's technically the highest graded card of this specific Andrew McCutcheon, this 2012 Topps Chrome Andrew McCutcheon. This is the highest graded card of this with Beckett because there's none higher than it. And again, that's all information you can find in population reports with these grading companies. Now, one of the most common questions I see in the hobby is, what is my card worth? I just pulled this card out of this pack. How do I know how much it's worth? Guys, it's not too hard to find out the comp of values of your cards, actually. There's a ton of resources out there. We'll go over a few right now. And of course, the big one for me is 130point.com. So I'll put some of it right here. As you can see at 130points.com, you can look up all prior or recent eBay sales of that card. So you wanna put in as much information as you can about the card, typically the year, the make, and the card number and the player that's on it. And if you guys are having struggling to find all that information, it's all gonna be available on the back of the card. So if you look at the bottom down here, it's gonna tell you that this card is 2023. It says tops, but you know it's Bowman because you bought it from Bowman. So it's 2023 Bowman. This is what I put BP12 is the card number and Jesus Baez, you want the player name, put as much info as you can in that search bar. And then it's gonna pull up all the recent sales of that card. So you can see what it sold for, you know, yesterday or three months ago. You know, it's gonna vary. It's gonna give you those different price points. Of course, if a player had a hot week or something like that, their card might've sold a little bit higher than it does now but you can kind of get those ranges of the prices and be able to find a nice comfortable average you're comfortable at selling that card or trading that card at aside from 130point.com guys there's also a lot of apps out there you can look up that will also you know be able to basically scan your card i'll show it right here the only other one i use is called center stage it's a free app it's not the best i'll tell you that much off the gate but um it does its job when it's needed. It, you know, it's pretty good, I'd say, where you'll basically scan the card, you can see in the video, and then it's gonna pull up that card, hopefully, and it will give you, again, those lists of the recent eBay sales, as well as it will tell you uh, recent graded card sales, if that card's been graded in certain PSA or BGS or SGC uh, sales of that card. So that's some information there you can see as well. So there's a few different apps. I know I think Sports Card Investor as well has developed an app that does this too. Uh, but again, there's kinks in it when you're scanning it, it will pull up other cards possibly, or it won't pull up the one you're looking for. So my you know, saving grace has always been going to 130point.com that I showed you here just a second ago, and just looking up your card and seeing what the most recent sales are from there, because that's where you're gonna get your best information from. But guys, when you're comping cards, the most important thing you do is do your research on the card. Know what you have, know what your card is, because you don't wanna go around and think you have a base card when it's actually you know, an SP variation. So know what you have in your hands when you're looking up the comp and make sure you're comping it appropriately. You know, say this card recently sold like $1,000, but there's other sales for like 200, $300. 
know you're not going to get that thousand dollar sale you know you want to find a comfortable range who knows why that card sold for a thousand dollars there's millions of reasons why cards sell for certain prices on the online market but you want to find that range that's comfortable and consistent for those card sales to make sure you know you are moving those cards if you are intending to you know buy and sell trade at a at a good clip now lastly guys after all this information what do you collect well that's what you need to decide so i've provided you this landscape of information on cards numbered cards auto cards memorabilia find out what you like whether it's certain teams certain players certain schools whatever it is find your niche that way when you're collecting you're always having fun you're not just hunting certain cards you know that it's always fun to hunt cards and like you know, Victor Wenbanyama is going to be a huge NBA prospect. So even when I'm opening packs of basketball next year, you're going to be hunting Victor Wenbanyama. But I'm still going to be hunt, looking for, you know, my Celtic cards, Jason Tatum's, Benedict Matherin. I'm a big fan of him. So having those guys that you call your PC, your personal collection, are those guys that you are collecting or those teams that you're collecting. If you're collecting certain series, like I love Paul Pierce and I love that Prism has that rainbow. So... I'm trying to collect a whole rainbow of Paul Pierce guys. There's, I think, 60 of them, and I have 24 right now. So that's just something I'm doing. So your PC is do what you love. You know, collect what you love. That way, you're always happy with what you're bringing in. You're never feeling like, oh, I wasted my money on that. You know, whether it's buying singles, chasing cards in boxes, just do what you like and don't worry about what other people say or what they're doing. Because you know, other people have more money, more access, more resources. You know, I'd love to be spending 10 grand on cards and doing breaks every night, but it's not in my bank account. But I do love watching it, and I wish those guys all the best when they do have their breaks for sure. But in the end, when you're collecting, collect what you love, collect who you love, because in the end, that'll make sure when you're in this hobby, you're having fun, and that is the key, is having fun in this hobby and passing that along to all the people around you and just keeping that going and making sure the hobby is constantly thriving guys because sports cards are fun sports are great and it's two of my favorite things for sure so i hope you guys enjoyed this video take all that information to heart make sure like i said you subscribe turn your notifications on feel free to message me on instagram uh, you can follow the account i'll put it right here cmk sports cards if you guys have any other questions or want to just reach out feel free to hit me up on there i love interacting with you guys but as always, we're going to be heading to the Fenway Card Show this weekend. So that'll be our next vlog coming to the channel. I can't wait to bring it to you guys. I can't wait to head to Fenway and rip some wax in the building. Looking forward to it so much. But as always, guys, thanks for tuning in. And I'll catch you in the next one.